الحمد لله نحمده سبحانه ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه قد بلغ الرسالة وأدى الأمانة ونصح الأمة وكشف الغمة وجاهد في سبيل دينه حتى أتاه اليقين فاللهم اجزه عنا وعن والدينا وعن الإسلام والمسلمين خير ما جازيت به نبيا عن قومي ورسولا عن أمته اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم آمين Last time we spoke about the creation of Adam and the dialogue, if you will, between Allah and the angels regarding the creation of Adam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordering the angels to prostrate to Adam and they all did except for Iblis who refused and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that right after the angels prostrated to Adam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala orders Adam to enter into the paradise. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ O Adam, dwell you and your wife in paradise, the paradise. The difference is, paradise could be any garden anywhere because it's nakra, it's undefined. But al jannah, it means ism alam, a specific noun that refers to a specific place. So al jannah could not and should not be construed to be any place on earth. We will notice later on when Allah sends Adam down. He will send him to earth. So he, what, if he were on earth, even in a garden, he wouldn't tell him, get down to earth. So this just to be clear. In the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala telling Adam, Uskun anta wa zawjuka. There are several issues related to that statement. To dwell is not to own. To dwell means to take for residence. Uskun sakana, also from it comes the word sakina, which is comfort and contentment. Sakana. From it also comes the word miskin, which is someone who is put to handicaps because of poverty. Severe poverty. So it is called miskin. Amsakahu al faqr aw aqadahu al faqr. He cannot move, he cannot travel, he cannot fend for himself. He is miskin. So when Adam was invited into paradise, definitely he had his wife with him. So Allah is talking to Adam. And his wife is going with him into paradise attached to her husband. Uskun anta wazawjuka. So she is attached to him. She is invited with him, alongside him, but through him. And one of the amazing things that you will notice in the Quran that the address of the Quran to all of us humans also comes in the masculine sense, not in the feminine sense. This has two reasons. Number one, in the Arabic language, even if there is only one man in the crowd or two, they are called in the masculine sense. They are addressed in the masculine sense. When do we address people only in the feminine sense? It is when they are all females. So, uskun anta wa zawjuka al-jannah. 
I mentioned in the beginning that uskun implies residence, take for a place of residence. And when you take a place for residence, it means one day you will get out of it. That is different from paradise and hellfire. People are told when they get there, it is permanent. So Allah has the language to say what he wants. And here the language is clear that we were not intended to be in paradise at that time eternally. It was only like, if you would call it, an experiment to show Adam, our father, the beauty of paradise, the joy of paradise, and to communicate this to his children and to his grandchildren and descendants after him. And that's what Adam did as both our father and the first prophet to be sent to mankind all together. أُسْكُنْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ وَكُلَا مِنْهَا And both of you eat from it. رَغَدًا رَغَدًا is the nature of paradise. Paradise's nature is رَغَد. رَغَد العيش is the best of livelihood in every aspect, in every way. رَغَدًا also means abundant, which means there is nothing short. You don't have to stand in line. You don't have to wait your turn. So, كُلَا مِنْهَا رَغَدًا رَغَدًا where? حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا Wherever you go, there is رَغَد. So, moving also, the freedom to move in paradise seems to be implied here. As Allah tells us to roam the earth, to seek our provision, Allah is telling us in paradise, you are not going to get stuck somewhere or ever feel bored. You will have the freedom to move and travel. And wherever you go, paradise provisions, they come to you and they move with you. And you will find them everywhere. So dwell you and your wife in the paradise and eat from it abundantly wherever you both please. See, wherever you please here, is coming after they enter paradise. Okay? When Allah told the children of Israel, which will come to in, in the few ayat that we will touch on, when Allah told the children of Israel, Uskunu هذه القرية وكلوا منها حيث شئتم رغدا. Wherever you want, you can get the abundance of everything. So the abundance is attached to where they want. Right? Here, wherever they go, there is abundance. This is the difference between blessing a community in a certain place or blessing everybody anywhere in paradise. حَيْثُ شِئْتُمْ رَغَدًا وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةِ Don't get near. You see, some people try to make the statement of the Qur'an against what the Qur'an is saying. So Allah says, وَلَا تَقْرَبُوا zina." Don't get near adultery. Right? Here it says, don't get near the tree. Wherever Allah uses distance prohibition, it means whatever He is prohibiting is either addictive or very attractive that it becomes a slippery slope. You get near it, you will not be able to go back. You cannot resist. So that tree seems to be very attractive, very beautiful, and the description of that tree will come to show that in Surah Al-A'raf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have the, uh, the devil Iblis tempt them, telling them, don't you like the tree of eternity and a kingdom that never perishes? So the attraction of the tree is, it does have a meaning. And the shaitan is telling Adam and Eve, if you don't eat from it, then you're not going to live for eternity. You're not going to stay here for eternity, which is the opposite of what Allah is saying. Allah is saying, don't get near that tree because he knows it will be very tempting and they cannot resist. That's the nature. And that's the nature of the tree. So Allah tells them, get away from it. Iblis says, come, try it out. And if you try it out, the only reason Allah prohibited you from eating from that tree is 
the potential that you may either live for eternity or turn into angels because angels mostly live in paradise they are there preparing everything for you may Allah make us among the people of paradise so don't come near this tree so the tree was identified right and the consequences are identified too فَتَكُونَا مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ You both will be among the wrongdoers. So this is not about Eve tempting Adam. It is about the shaitan tempting Adam and Eve together. And the language of the shaitan is clear that he was talking to both of them even though he was talking specifically to Adam in one uh, part of the Quran. In another side of the story, he was talking to both of them. So it must be that he spoke to Adam alone and he spoke to them together, both in trying to tempt both of them to fall. So here, فَتَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ It excludes the thinking that Eve is the culprit of the fall. Because Allah doesn't say, don't follow this woman. No, Allah says, don't follow this shaitan. Right? And they will be together among the wrongdoers if they do what? If they get near the tree, if they eat from the tree. So this exonerates the woman, Eve, from being the source of evil or the source of temptation. Next, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again assigns the blame and the problem here to Iblis. فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا and this is the first time in the Quran, in the sequential mention, here the shaitan is coming vivid and clear, which calls us after he refused to bow down to Adam. Here the role of the shaitan, after his arrogance and his demeaning of Adam, he now is coming with his own role that he would defy and try to tempt Adam and tempt his children. فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانِ أَزَلَّ is mentioned in the Qur'an also وَمِنْهَا أَزَّلَلْ أَنْ تَزِلَّ قَدَمٌ بَعْدَ ثُبُوتِهَا Lest a foot may slip after it was firm on the ground. So أَزَلَّ is not أَذَلَّ أَذَلَّ is to humiliate and demean. Okay? But أَزَلَّ بِزَّاي means to make someone slip. بالعربي يجارجارو يعني he would drag him into the temptation فأزلهما again the temptation was to both of them and both of them listened and complied with the temptation there is no separation between Adam and his culprit role and his wife the only difference is Allah in the Quran will put the blame on Adam in particular why? Because Allah ordered Adam into paradise first. And with him, Eve will come in. So if something happens, who is responsible ultimately? It's Adam. It is the man who is ultimately responsible about his household. So where is the blame? The blame is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ عَهِدْنَا إِلَىٰ آدَمَ مِنْ قَبْلُ فَنَاسِيَا وَلَمْ نَجِدْ لَهُ عَزْمًا Also, Allah says, فَعَصَى آدَمُ رَبَّهُ فَغَوَى So the blame is around Adam's neck. Eve is not even mentioned. And it seems that a natural relationship of a woman to a man is more shrouded in obedience and following and commitment. And this is not something that we can artificially make out of the text. But it is embedded in the description here. Where Adam went, she goes. Where Adam falls, she is out with him. Even though she shared the falling. Right? But the blame is resting around him because he is the leader. As the Prophet ﷺ says, وَالرَّجُلُ فِي بَيْتِهِ رَاعٍ and what? وَمَسْؤُولٌ عَنْ رَعِيَتِهِ Man is a caretaker, a shepherd in his flock, in his family, 
and he is responsible for his family. W where is the responsibility? If he doesn't take blame, he will take the blame. As he takes the credit for something good that runs in the family, he will take uh, also the, the, the reward for something that goes right in the family. In any way, فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا Both of them were told to get out of paradise. فَأَخْرَجَهُمَا مِمَّا كَانَا فِيهِ The shaytan caused them to exit out of where? Paradise. Right? Then what happened? وَقُلْنَا هَبِطُوا بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوُ Then what? وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرِّ Your place of settlement is on earth. It was not intended for paradise. Your ultimate goal, your ultimate invitation is to follow Adam's footsteps in his first entry into paradise and to follow the guidance that Allah will be talking about in a, in a minute here. So, لَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرْ Adam and Eve were created to be on earth until the day of judgment for this worldly experience that we all have. بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوْ Some of you will be enemies to each other. And وَلَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مُسْتَقَرٌ وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حِينٍ مَتَاعٌ are the things we use for livelihood purposes. Utensils that you use in the kitchen. And the word مَتَاعٌ really is very equivalent to the word utensils in that it is utilities. Anything that you use in this life is a tool. A tool to make your life easier. Whether you invent it or Allah made it like this, Allah created like this, or Allah gave it the nature for you to exploit and manufacture and develop. But all what we have in this earth is like utensils. You use it, you wash it, you use it again. When it wears out, what do you do? Throw it away, get something else. Right? Mata also is used for the stuff a traveler takes with him when he goes anywhere. Those are not permanent things, right? So you finish with it, you throw it away because it's not useful anyway. So, وَمَتَاعٌ إِلَى حين, Up to a term. So from the beginning, the Quran is very clear that we were intended to be on earth, we were intended to kind of like fight our way into paradise by fighting the shaitan and desires and everything else that would prevent us from going to paradise and at the same time taking each other by the hand and accepting the fact that Allah told us some of us will be fitna and will turn enemies to each other some will believe some will not some will accept the guidance of Allah some will invent their own way of life those are not very consistent. So people will differ. And part of what Allah told us, وَجَعَلْنَا بَعْضَكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ fitna. And as I mentioned before, when you put to fitna, when you put to fire the gold, the purpose is to get the gold separated from the ashes. So when Allah puts you through fitna or trial, Allah wants you to show Him your best. When Allah sends someone to test your patience, Allah wants to get your patience out, not your anger. When someone tests you in your money, in your health, in anything, the purpose is to get the best out of you. Like we test or put the, the gold in fire to get the pure gold out and leave the ashes uh, to, to, to stay behind. So all of this ilahin up to a term. Then Adam, after he got out of paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would tell us that he had sent Adam certain words to repent. He's teaching Adam what to say to repent, what to say to ask Allah for forgiveness, what to do when you do something wrong, and how you correct yourself. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ Those words came from Allah. Astaghfirullah al-Azim, 
is from Allah. O oh Allah, tub alayna, innaka anta tawwabu rahim is from Allah. Accept our repentance. You are the one who accepts repentance. This is words that come from Allah to teach us through Adam how to make up with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to mend fences in our relationship with him. So Allah is oft merciful, oft forgiving, but you have to submit your plead of guilt and you have to admit your responsibility and you have to ask Allah to forgive you and you have to promise not to do the same thing again and again and again. But even if you are weak and you keep doing something again and again and again, Allah will never cease or stop to forgive you. He is always ready to receive you again. But don't take him for granted. Don't try to take Allah for granted. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ نَهْبِطُوا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا We told them, all of you, get down. Get out of paradise and get down to earth. قُلْ نَهْبِطُوا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Whenever my guidance come unto you, he who follows my guidance, they shall have no fear on them, nor shall they ever grieve. Two major diseases that plague the human race from the time of Adam until today are al-khawf wal-hazan. La khawfun alayhim wa la hum yahzanun. The only security against worries, fears, depression, all of the mental uh, Ill health diseases that result from feelings, not from chemical imbalance, all of those are treated through your faith. If you trust Allah, you don't fear for things. If you trust Allah's promise, you work for it. If you believe and trust Allah's warning, you get away from what He warns you against. So basically, you live as a believer, you live in security, and you live in peace and safety with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَنْ تَبِعَ هُدَايَ So what is it against? There are two sources of guidance in this world. And there is a clear competition on your heart. Allah wants your heart for Him, Him alone, finished. The devil wants to take as much space of your heart as possible. And you have the power to choose whom you will follow. So Allah is inviting us to follow his guidance and expect this reward. You will live a life that is fear-free and worry-free. فَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ And as far as those who denied and disbelieved Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they belied his ayat, those have a different place. Those are the people of hellfire. May Allah protect us from hellfire. And they are going to live there for good, for eternity, forever. This is one of those ayat that we need to pay attention to. For a person to turn from whatever position he is in, into the kufr box or the kafirin box, they have to be presented with the message complete enough and then they reject it. Well, that raises a question. What about people that Allah describes in general saying, لَقَدْ كَفَرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ ثَالِثُ ثَلَاثَ He describes the whole category of people who claim that Allah is a third of three, he describes this category of people that they have committed kufr. Yes, this is a description of their act. I want you to pay attention. There is a difference between describing the act as kufr and describing and naming the group as kafir. To name a person as a kafir, you need to communicate the message to them first complete enough, adequate enough 
for similar people to understand. When they understand and make a choice, then they can be given a name. If the choice is to believe, then we call them believers. If the choice is to disbelieve, we call them disbelievers. But you don't label a blanket group of people other than what Allah put together in a category as kafaru. Kafaru means they rejected the message. So if they did not get the message, how could they be kafir? What did they reject if not the message? So people who grew up in a culture of kufr, they are not to be labeled as kafir until the message is presented to them and they refuse it. This is something very important to understand because we have in our upbringing culture terminologies that need clarification and this is one of them. This is one term we need to be clear about what does it mean in the Quran. Uh, I think we'll stop here and uh, we will open a new subject next time so the time now will not allow us to go there but we are continuing to cover people in the Quran whether as groups or as a small uh, family or anything so we are trying to capture what the Quran says to people what the Quran says about people and this is the theme of uh, our khutbah for the next few weeks inshallah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to understand our book and to practice it. Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala ibadihi alladhina astafa wa ashadu an la ilaha illa Allah wahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh وصفوته من خلقه وحبيبه اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحابته ومن اتبع سنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين Brothers and sisters We are going through unsettling times in our nation here in the United States and it is almost equally unsettling for people around the world because there is a trend there is a trend of right-wing massive international conspiracy to control the world according to certain agenda. This shouldn't bother any of us. It shouldn't because we are not living according to what people plot and plan in secret against us. We are living by our faith. If you are faithful, then you derive your stability, your balance, your sense of happiness from your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not by what people conspire or plot secretly. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us that you shouldn't worry about what people plot in secret. He says, إِنَّهُمْ يَكِيدُونَ كَيْدًا وَأَكِيدُ كَيْدًا They plot and plan and I have my plot and plan. وَيَمْكُرُونَ وَيَمْكُرُ Allah. Allah didn't say, so you also conspire against them. There is no such a thing. And why didn't Allah unleash our ability for conspiracy and all of this? Because conspiracy by nature is evil. Conspiracy means that you have to go into secret Kahoot agreements with people to do something that you don't want anybody to know. Well, Allah knows it. And Allah will take care of anyone who does evil plotting. Evil conspiracies only would siege the people who do them. That's all what it is. And Allah will definitely take care of you so long as you continue to live with Allah. Recently, I don't know if you're following the news as I caught some piece of the news, the most extreme of extremists in Holland lost his bid for election. And he was up until few days before the voting day, he was on the top of the poll and the next one was tens of points behind. Allah does 
his work, especially if you are sincere, if you rely on Allah, if you trust Allah, Allah will deliver even when you are asleep. You don't have to do anything. And I'm not saying that as Muslims we should go to sleep and wait for things to happen. But I'm saying we should never get into evil conspiracies under any circumstances. Anything that's prohibited in Islam, we should never get into it. Not out of anger, not out of oppression, not out of anything. We should always use the guidance of Allah to get our rights and use the proper channels to, to get justice if we are wronged. But we should never get into evil, private, secret conspiracies against anyone. This is point number one. Point number two, I believe we need to put more effort in organizing and reorganizing our community. Things as they are happening today in our community are not settling for many of us. We need to establish our institutions and our communities on the Islamic foundation. And I will devote some time to talk about this in details uh, some other time. But just for now, we need to put our eyes and our heads and our ears together to see what is going on wrong and what is going on right in our community so that we can leave the world a better place for our children and for their children. These are issues that I wanted to bring to your attention. Inshallah, uh, this coming uh, April, I'm sorry, April 9, which is Sunday, uh, not this Sunday, but April 9, the Sunday, April 9th, uh, there will be a fundraising uh, luncheon for Ethiopia. This will be at 12 p.m. And uh, the function itself will start at 1. And the tickets are in the office. Uh, Ethiopia, like many of the countries of the Horn of Africa, are exposed to severe drought. Animals are dying, farms are dying, people are dying. So we need to do our role in, in this issue. Also, uh, in an important announcement for many of us, those who have degrees and they can be teachers or administrators, uh, there is an opportunity opening in King Abdullah University, which is opening this coming September in Herandon, Virginia. King Abdullah University comes on the heels of closing the Islamic Saudi Academy that used to be in Alexandria, Virginia. They moved to uh, Harandan. And this coming Saturday, which is tomorrow, between 10 and 2, they are receiving applicants for teaching positions and administrative positions. So even if you don't have your certificate, take your resume and go for the meeting and see what happens. May Allah open good doors for everybody. اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وقنا واصرف عنا شر ما قضيت اللهم اقسم لنا من خشيتك ما تحول به بيننا وبين معصيتك ومن طاعتك ما تبلغنا به جنتك ومن اليقين ما تهون به علينا مصائب الدنيا ومتعنا اللهم بأسماعنا وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر شهد أن لا إله إلا الله شهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا إله إلا الله استقيموا واستووا واعتدلوا الله أكبر
الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين نعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين يا أيها الإنسان ما غرك بربك الكريم الذي خلقك فسواك فعدلك في أي صورة ما شاء 